So welcome to this third session of the ELD MOOC. Um, I'm very happy to have you all on board and to see you again online. I am Claudia Musekamp and I am the online tutor and um, the moderator for this session and I will guide you uh, through the presentation. Uh, before I introduce uh, today's speaker, Sarah Ordera, you all already see her in uh, the little window uh, at the bottom. Before I introduce uh, Sarah Ordera, let me um, make a few remarks uh, on uh, the assignment. Um, we have um, I've looked at uh, some of the preparation that uh, all of you have been doing um, uh, in the last uh, two weeks and I have to say that I'm very impressed with uh, what I've seen so far. Um, there have been some great assignments in preparation about the, let me just say, name a few words, about the Gutting Forest, about uh, Brown County, US, about Dra Valley in Morocco, Nansanga Farm, um, about Hebal Hillock in India, uh, same Bitar Kanika Mangrove in India, about Mount Kenya, the Victoria Lake, Paso Grande, uh, Barotse. Uh, so uh, I'm really happy how this has been going so far and I'm really looking forward to, to see all these um, assignments uh, ready later this week. Um, I um, have been asked um, to uh, present um, a paper uh, which has been written by um, um, one of the tutors of uh, our online MOOC. Um, I will do that a little later because I forgot to upload it. Um, but it, it's a paper uh, which also talks about the different values of the um, ecosystem and how to look at it. It has been prepared after sessions uh, of DesertNet and the uh, UNCC, UNCCD, all these abbreviations, UNCCD um, um, scientific committees meetings. Um, we, we will have uh, a presentation this afternoon on ELD and the business sector on um, the private sector. Um, Sarah Odera will be our speaker, but uh, before we, uh, I turn over to Sarah, I would like to ask you two questions. Uh, I've seen that there is, has been already some debate about uh, getting businesses involved in the practices of sustainable land management. Uh, and so, uh, I was wondering, um, uh, do you think we should uh, engage business businesses at all in sustainable land management or do you think it's really not uh, worth uh, doing it? Um, so you should be able to see the poll now. Um, I will show the results as they come in. Um, please answer uh, our question of whether you think we should engage businesses in sustainable land management uh, practices. Um, we know that um, not so many businesses have started engaging in uh, sustainable
sustainable land management and we'll uh, hear more from Sarah about the reasons and, um, and uh, what can be done. But uh, what I would like to know from you is, do you think there should be an engagement? I think most of you have already replied, so I see a strong majority is in favoring uh, in favor of engaging businesses in uh, sustainable land management practices. And uh, given this result, I would like to ask you another question. Um, and the question is, um, what do you think, um, what do you think, uh, why have business uh, not been engaged in sustainable land, manage uh, land management so far? What do you think? Um, they don't want to engage in sustainable land management, it's not in their business interest. Um, they um, uh, they don't want um, oh and the same, um, I'm sorry uh, I have to put sorry um, they don't I have to um, I've had to revise the question. Sorry, they don't. Uh, do you think they don't want to engage in sustainable management, or they don't know about sustainable land management, or do you think they don't know how to do it? Uh, what do you think uh, is most probable in terms of businesses and uh, sustainable land management? I see. Strong opinions coming in here. Okay. So, how do you think about uh, businesses, the private sector? So, as you see, um, about half of the groups think um, business don't know about. Uh, sustainable land man uh, they don't know how to do sustainable land management so that's a question of uh, educating how to do it uh, another third more of third things that it's um, they don't they are not informed that there's sustainable land management practices or uh, only one-fifth believes um, they don't want to engage and um, I guess we'll hear now more from Sarah Odera today. I'm very happy to present her as a speaker. Um, Sarah is um, has a bachelor in communications. She's originally from Kenya but has lived in Germany for a long time as far as I understand. Uh, she holds, Sarah Odera holds a master's degree in uh, global political economy and uh, she has worked with the German uh, Ministry of the Environment uh, for some time, later has joined uh, the TEEB, also uh, an environmental uh, organization, and she is now with uh, the ELD Secretariat as uh, the communication specialist. So welcome with me, Sarah Odera, to this afternoon top, uh, talk about um, ELD and uh, sustainable land management and the private sector. Please. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I'll send a talk and uh, Claudia, this is an invitation and I need you to change the slides for the presentation so that everyone can see that. And I'll start off by welcoming you, all of you, to the time session of this group. During this session, we are going to discuss on the ELD and the private sector engagement, more so 
we are going to talk about the second EOB initiative, private sector workshop results, that took place last week in Rwanda. During this session, we are going to go through EOB target groups. We are going to look into reasons for engaging the private sector. Background, aims of the workshop, resources, expertise, and tasks, results of workshop, critics, and suggestions for the ELD initiative, ELD initiative follow-up activities, as well as the case studies. I can see that there's a problem with the, with the sound. Is there anything I can do to adjust it before I continue? Okay, so I'll continue since everyone says that it is much better. Claudia, could you move to the next slide, slide number three? The next one, thanks. I would like to start us off by introducing the ELD target groups. These target groups are also the, where the reports, the ELD reports will be based upon. One of our target groups is the political decision makers. They are the key drivers of policy change due to their critical role in allocating resources and policy formulation. The report is intended to provide them with accurate and suitable information on land degradation. This information is to enable them to make informed decisions and take appropriate measures on matters such as reform of farm harmful subsidies or development of payments for ecosystem services. Our next target group are the scientific community. ELD, as you may be aware, is a scientific endeavor, and they are the main generators of scientific knowledge that provide reliable data and application-oriented tools as a basis for policy-making and investment decisions. The report is planned to provide a state-of-art synthesis of theory and methods for valuing land degradation and land services for their use. The third and of interest in this discussion is the private sector. These form the main stakeholders who make direct and indirect use of land. This component of ELD is intended to benefit business by identifying business investment opportunities and incentives linked to the preservation and sustainable management of land services and promote new tools for measuring and reporting their impact. Next, we would like to look at the reasons for engaging the private sector. Claudia, could you change the slide? Our interests for engaging private sector play an important role in the management and use of natural resources. For a company, or any company, in direct contact with land, land is key asset and is managed with normal business tools. A new investment has to have a flavor of time, return on investment, and internal rate of return that meets the company's criteria for new investment or operations management. For companies, distant in the value chain, land is mostly not seen as core business, which leaves it from the standard calculations and toolkit. Risk analysis for supply chain and new investment is where land comes closest. Assisting companies to assess land degradation risk to their business is the path that we can be, can be taken when involving the private sector. From the side of the private sector, there is a growing overlap between public and private interests and addressing sustainable issues in a way to get new markets and create new business opportunities. Land degradation induces changes, e.g. in the cost and availability of resources, and have a direct impact on the cost, stru cost structure and profitability of any company. Some years back, degradation risks and opportunities might not have been very well understood priority for businesses. However, there is an increase from both large and small private sector companies. The interest is due to increased sustainability concerns, e.g. on raw materials, and companies seeing economic benefits and new opportunities in reducing land degradation. 
The results from these workshops will contribute greatly in the creation of the yearly business report that is set to be produced in January 2015, showing that it is worth for businesses to invest in sustainable land management. Going on to the background, could you change to the next slide, Claudia? I would like to shortly take us back to the first yearly private sector workshop, which was held in June 2013. The workshop was attended by over 30 participants, resulting in an economic analysis by ELD on business exposure to the risks of land degradation and the benefits of sustainable land management. This is portrayed, excuse me, this is well portrayed in the ELD business brief, Opportunity Loss, that is available for download as well on our website. Pinpointed was also the seven key sectors heavily exposed to high risk. These include basic resources, e.g. forestry, paper, metal, construction and materials, food and beverage, industrial goods and services, for example, transportation, packaging, leisure and travel, airlines, hotels, restaurants, personal and household goods, for example, consumer electronics, tobacco, clothing, footwear, and utilities. This is water and electricity. Based on this, we organized a second private sector workshop that was held on 11 to 12 March in Bonn. We had invited companies and institutions that directly or indirectly deal with land and land-based ecosystems in their value chain. These also included companies that had taken part in the first EOD private sector workshop. This workshop brought together over 40 participants from multinationals, small companies, and other international organizations. Some of the interested companies included Shell, Syngenta, BASF, Mondi, k -S, and RVE. The aims of this workshop, Claudia, could you move to the next? The aim of this workshop was to establish how to incorporate land into private sector processes and strategies. We also wanted to pinpoint components of a toolkit for the private sector as a set of resources for companies to integrate sustainable land management in their processes. It could take the shape of a web-based platform where all data needed to implement sustainable land management can be found, e.g. case studies, list of websites, which operation managers could refer to when making decisions. Another aim of the workshop was to raise awareness by showcasing a real case study, not only from the private sector, but also from organizations that have been dealing with the private sector and land degradation issues. We were also to create a platform where we can share expert advice from businesses and organizations. The next slide, which is pinpointing on resources, expertise, and drafts, it has a lot of information, but this slide, the two slides that will come next, I would like us to look at it but not go deep into it as we can share this once the presentation is over. But these slides show us the resource and gaps discussed at the workshop and that were presented. On the table, we have the area of focus, which was pinpointed, the resources which are available from different organizations, as well as expertise contribution. I would like to highlight on the gaps that are indicated in red. For example, under awareness, there are gaps in cost of inaction but benefits of action and research on the value chain impact. Further gaps indicated are indicated on the table and you can look at them later on. We would also like to draw your attention on the resources. You can see that there are various ongoing projects by different companies and organizations. ELD's aim is to build up on these expertise and experiences and focus on areas that are still needed. On 
the table, you can also see the various expertise that different companies and organizations are willing and ready to provide in further discussion of sustainable land management and the private sector. On the results of the workshop, Claudia, if you can move to the next. Yeah, yeah uh, let, let me just uh, ask a, few, a short question. What do you think uh, it was the reason I, I asked what, the question that I asked in the beginning? What do you think are the reasons that uh, many business uh, haven't gone uh, or haven't really adopted sustain in, or haven't gotten engaged in sustainable land management practices? Was that that they didn't know about it? That they, they didn't want it or that they uh, didn't know how to get engaged? I would say that the reason why businesses have not so far engaged in sustainable land management, one, is that there are businesses that, that are not aware of the risks or opportunities that are within dealing with sustainable land management. There is also the other side that they do not know how to engage it or how to, how to integrate it in their corporate system, and this needs to be developed as well. Hello? Okay. We will look at we will look at the other the next slide which is on the results of the workshop. If you can move to the results of the workshop, the PowerPoint slide on the results of the workshop, Claudia. Yes, yeah, thank you. From the workshop, we were able to establish the required components of a toolkit for the private sector. This will be available in a final report that we will be able to share with you by the end of this week or by the beginning of the next week. We also benefited from expert advice on how to include sustainable land management in company standard protocols. We also managed to receive committed interest from companies and organizations. This includes companies such as Syngenta, Shell, K plus S, and organizations such as IUCN and Ecosystem Return Foundation. Commitments are in form of organization of the next workshop, carrying out case studies, expert advice, and resources. Finally, we were also able to develop a clear plan on further steps in engaging the private sector. If we move to the next slide, on the critics and suggestions for the ELD initiative. One of the critics was on the more participation and contribution from the private sector. We also had a suggestion that we should involve more financial institutions and educational institutions such as business schools and other organizations dealing with private sector, e.g. World Resource Institute. They also called upon both the private sector and the other organizations, called upon more awareness raising for the private sector and also for more organizations really needed to use the language that is positive and that can be can reflect the business language or that the business sector can recognize more easily. From this we had also ELD initiative follow up activity. Now we can move to the next slide. Some of the activities that are already pinpointed or that we are also planning already planning to do is development of the content of the toolkit, and this will be done in close cooperation with the private sector and other organizations. We are also working on how to integrate this process into the existing ELD initiative working group. We will also advance our outreach to enhance coherence between private and public sector. This was called upon by the private sector, and we plan to organize the third private sector workshop at the end of June 2014 to concretize the toolkit with further participation 
and contribution from the private sector. Lastly, I would like to present on the case study. Claudia wrote the text. From the map here, I have highlighted just four case studies, but will not go into discussing each. I will just take an example from one of the ones that I have highlighted, and that is the Newmont Ghana case, a Hoho mine. This is a gold mining industry that has caused severe land degradation for local communities affecting their agriculture, land, and water. What kind of risk is involved? Opportunity cost, brand image, and on business and profitability risk, there's the risk of acceptability within the local community, license to operate, and future investment. The new month, mining company works to mitigate land degradation effects and support the local business community. How? Support to education in local communities where they have been able to restrict the growth of weed, your creek, that affects local agriculture and biodiversity, make business of the plant for the local community. This case is built on collaboration with local, education, image gain, indirect business gain through the strengthening of supply chain to creation of local services for the mining for the mining industry. What I would like to highlight on this slide is that there are nine private sector case studies. These are available on the ELD business grid of which I told you this down, you can download from our website. And these are case studies that have been carried out by companies such as Newmont or Wisherling or L'Oreal. These case studies focus on the seven sectors heavily exposed to risk as was highlighted in the business report, e.g. the basic resources or utility industry. We should have in mind that venturing in dialogue with the private sector is a new field for the ELD. And therefore, we are in the process of learning and developing further engagement spheres. In the end, we hope to be able to present a private sector case study of which ELD is part of at ground level and from the beginning to the end. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation, and now I'll hand over to Claudia. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for this uh, overview of the results of uh, the business sector. I have uh, now understood a little bit more about what uh, moves the business sector, and I've understood that risk uh, analysis is um, a big part of their consideration as well as new opportunities. Uh, now I've got uh, two questions and uh, uh, let me ask those before I hand over to you again. And one uh, is um, there has been um, talk about uh, a toolkit for business and I was wondering uh, what would be uh, the toolkit about or what would be um, the, the, the idea of the toolkits and the tools available? That's question number one. And the second is um, I've seen that on that map you have uh, also the case of the Ecuador tree people that's uh, on the left side on Ecuador and it's a lot about uh, tourism and uh, I have learned that tourism particularly flying to a destination is really bad for uh, um, the environment leaves a heavy um, ecological footprint and so I was wondering isn't that uh, 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 um, why, while on the one hand uh, tourism 
makes uh, a new livelihood for people, it creates um, ecological problems on the other side. So that's my questions, toolkits and the Ecuador case. I hand over to you. On the question about the toolkit, we would like to, in the discussions, first of all, we wanted to establish the areas where the toolkit should focus on. Yeah. And these are the areas that you mentioned, such as on raising awareness, on screening, on the focusing on the goal and objectives of the businesses, and on the management options. So basically, the toolkit is going to help businesses so that they can know on how to integrate sustainable land management into the normal corporate system. That will be our first step. On 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 Ecuador, as you can as you can see, maybe I should have said it before. Most of the case studies presented on the business report, not most, but all of the case studies presented on the business are case studies that have been taken up with companies or organizations dealing on the area or in a particular region. For example, now when we take the Ecuador case, this has been done by a company that is conducting tourism in Ecuador. So I would, I would assume that when they do an analysis, they do not go as far as where the tourists come from. But you do have a point when you say that when the tourists travel, then it causes a lot of harm, even though when they arrive in the particular place, then it helps the community. I think in this case is where we would come in as the EOD with our toolkit, so that then a company does not just look in one area, but then focuses on the whole value chain of what they have engaged in. In this case, then they would not only focus on Ecuador, but then would have a chance to use the EOD kit and see that from where the tourists come from, or all the aspects that can affect the business in one way or another. Once they use the toolkit, then they are able also not only to focus on Ecuador and community building, but also to focus on how they can try and mitigate the effects of the tourists coming, for example, from Kenya or from Germany to Ecuador. Sarah for these comments. I've got more questions to be answered coming from the chat. Um, I will just uh, read them and then hand over to you. Uh, question number one, uh, do you feel seed patenting by MNCs affects the potential of land degradation? So question number one is about seed patenting. Uh, second, what do you think is the best way to educate the youth? So question number two on education and question number three, do you feel that CSR, corporate social responsibility, is enacted because it's a trend or do you think it will be long lasting? So corporate so social responsibility just um, fancy or a long lasting commitment. I will hand over to Sarah. Just repeat your first question because I missed it out. They are all, they are all on the screen.
one, I would say, is awareness raising by involving the youth in some of the activities that we are doing concerning sustainable land management. We can also we can also involve it in, in the curriculum and in education setting. And in one way, of course, when we talk about business schools, we look at people who are already in universities. But this is one area because we are teaching business. This is where the business teaching goes on. And if we contact the schools, then it can also be integrated in this way. Also, on the other hand, it also depends, depends on the community that we are targeting. And we have to look at the community and see how their interaction with the youth are. In the case, for example, of Germany, I would say that the best way to use the youth or to educate the youth is to put, is to talk about sustainable land management in what the youth find interesting. Maybe on Facebook, put it on the TVs, put it as a video, use films so that they get to learn about it. But in other areas, for example, if we want to educate the youth, and we are targeting maybe somewhere in, in Kenya, in the rural regions, then we have to package it in a different way in order to use it to get to the youth. We could put it on billboards. We could put them as flags out where they can see or where the youth meet, you know, and hold small discussions to inform the youth on this. So um, as much as we would also like to reach out to the youth, there are various ways that can be can be used, and this depends on our target area and who, who exactly we are targeting within this youth group. The last question asking on CSR, if CSR is enacted because it is a trend, or if we think that it is long-lasting in terms of sustainable learning. We have to accept that for businesses, image is 70%. They worry what the people think about them because this also affects their sales. So their involvement in CSR, mainly their goal is for their image, but also we have to accept that as we continue and as businesses come to realize that addressing sustainable land management issues is, is on one hand the right thing to do, but then it's it is also, in a way, helping on a community. So as much as there is no clear line that we can say that CSR is on one side is just for the business, or say it is something that is sustainable, what we have to what we have to do is that we take up what has is already been done and really talk to the business because the fact that they are engaging in CSR means that they are already aware about what is going on, and we can build on so that then they move out from CSR and have a committed thing in involving themselves in sustainable land management. Okay, thank you, Sarah, so far. Um, well, there, there have been a couple of questions already on the private sector and uh, some questions in the chat uh, but I would uh, turn over the microphone to you to all of you now uh, so anybody who would like to talk now may do so now um, I would uh, if you uh, want to talk, uh, you may want to raise your hand. Uh, it's, you can use that hand button in the very upper left corner. You see that hand. If you want to talk, please raise your hand. Santiago from the GIZ team will assign uh, the microphone to you. Um, if you are uh, are assigned uh, speakers' rights, then you have to click on that little red microphone just next to your name. It's the microphone and the camera next to your name. Click on the microphone in private businesses. And it was said that private businesses are not really interested in um, getting involved in sustainable land management because it has a cost for them. So, uh, could you comment on that, Sarah, please? Hello. I do, I do agree with you. I would have to say that 
had a cost for them. But that's why we're doing the economic study. Because what we need to show them, generally what private sector is interested in is profit, share value, and opportunity. And with the economic study, the UN have numbers that we are able to show them that engaging in sustainable land management is not only good for the communities, but also is good for the businesses in the long run. And I believe that once they see this, then they will also change. Because what private sector is also interested in is in securing what they need, labor or market, or even where they get their raw materials. And therefore, I think with a good study where we can have the numbers, then we are able to get some of the private sector to rethink how they manage their their, their businesses. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Sarah? So Sarah, so Sarah yes, sir. here's a question, uh, what advice should be included in the toolkit if business, businesses face opposition from NGOs or uh, government organizations? We, I, would, I would take a step back and not look at it from when businesses face opposition because we are already advising businesses to engage with government, to engage with NGOs, to engage with other organizations in dealing with sustainable land management. So we would assume that whatever they come up with will be a collaborative thing, will be something involving as many stakeholders as possible so that they do not face this in the end. But in cases where, because that could happen, that they have involved other stakeholders but still face opposition, then there is reason for open dialogue. They should look at it not as critics, but then look at it as a way to develop. They could invite these opposition and see what they can do from then on. We could also tell them that they could also expound on the benefits of their further engagement. I hand over back to you. Thank you, Sarah. So, experiences, civil sector and uh, business, civil society organizations and business sector. Um, those of you whose audio is not working, maybe you can repeat your questions in the chat. But I hand over to Sarah, civil society and business sector. Was really asking. I can see on the chat someone saying that he's asking whether DLD is a business section or civil society, and I thought that that was more his question. And and I'd like to answer that we are not business sector. DLD itself is an organization. We are conducting a study. It is a project that has received funds from various partner organizations to conduct a study on the economic value of practicing sustainable land management for different sectors. So we are not a business sector and we are not a civil society, even though ELD is hosted by GIZ, which is an agency of the Ministry of Development in Germany. Private sector, so to speak. 
At the moment, we are trying to also engage different different governments, not only as partners, but that they may also join in in, um, in this discussion, especially for the next meeting that we are organizing for June. So I do agree with you that governments should be involved, and this is an area that we, we as PLT will work on improving as well and seeing how we can involve the government. But if I may add as well, do note that one of our target groups are political decision makers. And here is where we put also government. And when we talk about political decision makers, it's not just the high ranking political decision makers, but we're also talking about decision makers in, in the community, in national level, in regional level. And this is one of our major stakeholders. about uh, the scope of the private sector as well. Can you comment on what would be uh, the business sector's range of uh, engagement and uh, what, what would be uh, the boundaries? I switch over.
thank you for all of you for joining us today. Thank you uh, to the GIZ team for making that uh, possible. Um, we'll have uh, on uh, now before I should present you. Um, sorry, uh, this ERD team has asked me uh, to show you um, this downloadable file. It's, um, it's, um, oh, sorry. Uh, it's a file by that has been set up uh, by uh, Mariam Aktor Schuster. She is a, a long standing expert on uh, combating uh, desertification and she has uh, worked with DesertNet and uh, come up with all these uh, information on how to value ecosystem. That's what we will be doing in the next uh, couple of weeks. We'll have uh, already looked at ecosystem services. Uh, that's uh, this week's assignment. It's due on March 22. And uh, um, she is uh, talking in this report on uh, uh, on what are different uh, approaches is to um, valuing an ecosystem. You can download that file uh, by left clicking. If you have a Windows computer, it should be left clicking uh, uh, this file. Very interesting uh, to read and another organization from the field, uh, DesertNet and UNCCD. Uh, so Please download that file, but it will also be available uh, in on the uh, website. So um, this is what uh, the uh, yeah the secretariat has asked me to ask me to present to you. And next week we'll have a speaker on economic evaluation methods. That's uh, next week's topic. We will look at uh, different methods of how to value the ecosystem. In this assignment, we'll uh, make a summary of ecosystem services in the cases you've chosen. Next week, we will uh, look at what economics has to offer in terms of actual evaluation on valuing and putting on, on sort of putting a price tag onto um, ecosystem services. So that will be uh, next week's uh, next week's speaker and I'm looking forward uh, to seeing you online next week again. So um, now comes the real fun part. Uh, switch on your webcams. I say 